Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Sirhan, and I have the pleasure of introducing today Dr. Edward Dennis as the recipient of the ASBMB Burt and Natalie Valley Award in Biomedical Sciences for his outstanding accomplishments. I had the pleasure of knowing Burt Valley pictured here. You can read about his extraordinary career and legacy at the Valley Foundation website. Professor Dennis, I'm sure Bert would be pleased uh, to be this year's recipient of this important award because of his lifelong scientific achievements and dedication to outstanding research in biochemistry and importantly, his sustained contributions to the scientific community. He is an exceptional scientist and a leader in the field, an outstanding role model, exceptional mentor, and is most worthy of this award. Earlier recipients of this prestigious award include Craig Thompson, Ron Evans, Nobel laureate Aziz Singh Carr, and David Eisenberg, just to name a few. Dr. Dennis obtained his undergraduate degree at Yale and doctoral degree at Harvard, carried out postdoctoral studies with a very well-known phospholipid biochemist, Eugene Kennedy at Harvard Medical School, and has received prestigious honorary degrees in medicine from both German and French universities. He received many awards and honors, including the ASBMB Avanti Award and has over 420 scholarly publications. As you'll hear today, Ed is the father of phospholipase enzymology and interactions with membranes. Dr. Dennis's research discovered novel structure activity and allosteric relationships for the key members of the superfamily of phospholipase A2 enzymes. He's made many seminal contributions that exemplify Dr. Dennis's rigor and commitment to research and multidisciplinary collaborations. In service to our scientific community, among his many positions, Ed has served as chair and president of the Keystone Symposium Board of Directors and as editor-in-chief of ASBMB's Journal of Lipid research for 15 years. His most important leadership role worldwide is exemplified by his creating the Lipid Maps Initiative in 2003 that continues on to this day. In this role, he's brought together distinct areas of biochemistry and molecular biology and initiated links between lipid investigators that have led to unparalleled discoveries that have yet to be fully appreciated. These seminal achievements of the Lipid Maps Consortium are laying the groundwork to many important areas of lipidomics. Ed Dennis is most deserving of this prestigious ASBMB award to honor Bird Valley and shall now present his lecture. Thank you, Charlie. I am indeed honored to have been nominated by you and others and to be selected by the ASBMB Awards Selection Committee to join the company of the illustrious past awardees. I knew Bert Valley as a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, and I always admired his elegant studies on enzyme mechanism, including the role of zinc in numerous enzymes but especially his elucidation of the mechanism of human alcohol dehydrogenase, a very important enzyme in our metabolism. So I am indeed honored to be the recipient of the Burt Valley Award. I most appreciate the contributions of the numerous undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, project scientists, staff research associates, visiting scientists, and sabbatical visitors who graced my laboratory, as well as my numerous collaborators. Most are named in this reflection that I was asked uh, to write for JBC a few years ago. I wish to also thank 
NIH for continuously supporting my research on phospholipase A2 through my NIGMS R01 grant, now in its 45th year and just renewed for another five years as a MIRA. Today, I'm going to just focus on our very recent work aimed at understanding phospholipase allosterism, including some recent unpublished results of two postdocs. I will acknowledge the specific students and collaborators at the end of my talk. Phospholipase A2s are a super family of enzymes. Some are degradative, some are biosynthetic, and some are signaling. There's over 50 distinct phospholipase A2s. All of them act stereospecifically to hydrolyze the fatty acid at the middle or SN2 position of membrane phospholipids. When they produce as products lysophospholipids and free fatty acids, they are degradative enzymes. When the uh, enzyme is coupled to an acyl transferase that specifically puts a polyunsaturated fatty acid or PUFA back in that SN2 position to make a new phospholipid that has been remodeled, then they become biosynthetic. When the products are converted by other enzymes to ligands that activate G-coupled protein receptors such as LPA or PGE2, then they are signaling enzymes. Now, with all of the different phospholipase A2s, I am going to focus today on just four of them. But these four are the major four categories of phospholipase A2 that have been the most well studied. They are all highly purified, recombinant human enzymes that we study in vitro in our laboratories. The first is cytosolic phospholipase A2, or CPLA2, which, is, which associates with the Golgi and stereospecifically releases arachidonic acid, a pro-inflammatory fatty acid that leads to inflammation and has a major role in signaling. Another cytosolic phospholipase A2 is IPLA2, sometimes associated with mitochondria, that releases unsaturated fatty acids and is heavily involved in membrane remodeling. A third enzyme is S or secreted PLA2, which is secreted outside the cell and acts exteriorly to release both saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, and sometimes uh, is endocytosed and may act in the cell as well. The final and fourth enzyme is LPPLA2 or lipoprotein-associated PLA2, which uh, associates with LDL and HDL and specifically releases only very short chain fatty acids as in PATH or oxidized fatty acids. Now we recognized very early on in our studies, some 45 years ago, that if we're going to study these phospholipase A2s, they are all water soluble. And all four of these enzymes are water soluble. But if they're going to interact with a phospholipid substrate, which resides only in membranes or micelles and not freely in solution, the two must interact. So the first step of a phospholipase action is the water-soluble enzyme associates with the membrane or the micelle. Pictured here is a mixed micelle with phospholipid in red and a non-ionic surfactant Triton X100 in yellow. And this is the bulk step that depends on the concentration of enzyme and membranes or micelles. And then there's a second step. When the enzyme is associated with the surface, the phospholipids in red laterally diffuse around the surface of the micelle or membrane very rapidly until a single phospholipid is sucked into the catalytic site. Catalysis occurs, the products diffuse back around the membrane. This second step depends kinetically on the surface concentration of the specific phospholipid substrate in the surface of the micelle 
And these kinetic approaches hold true to this day. Now, about a decade ago, our laboratory uh, turned to using the technique of deuterium exchange mass spectrometry to look specifically for the first time at the interaction of proteins with individual phospholipid substrates and their interactions with the membrane. Quite simply, one takes the phospholipase A2 in aqueous solution, one uh, mixes it with phospholipid vesicles, allows them to associate, uh, dilutes in D2O, and then measures the rate of deuterium exchange with the amide proton on each of the amino acids in the polypeptide backbone of the enzyme. And uh, in essence, where the enzyme interacts with the membrane or where a phospholipid is pulled up into the enzyme active site, the rate of deuterium exchange is diminished. Uh, both by proximity and by conformational change uh, effects that can be quite complicated. But simply speaking, in this example, we uh, looked at that last enzyme I introduced, lipoprotein-associated PLA2 or LPPLA2, and uh, using the deuterium exchange and molecular dynamic simulations guided by the HD exchange, uh, we came to the following conclusion. This is the uh, whole structure of LPPLA2. It's about a 45,000 molecular weight uh, 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 enzyme. The cat catalytic site is right where my red pointer is. And when we uh, 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 exposed it to intact human HDL, we found that there were three helices that uh, were affected by the, affected the deuterium exchange. This one up here, this one here, and the third one here. To deconvolute this, we looked at the interaction of the enzyme by deuterium exchange with the major lipoprotein of HDL, APOA1, and found that only this helix was involved. When we looked at phospholipid vesicles, we found that only this helix was involved, but with intact HDL, all three of these helixes were involved, suggesting that the enzyme docks on the membrane in the manner shown, and uh, uh, all three of these uh, constitute that interaction site. In the interest of time, I'm only gonna focus on this single helix right here that interacts with the membrane. Shown here is the crystal structure of LPPLA2 uh, uh, in a, uh, a, a, and uh, the helix that I was just pointing to that interacts with membranes is in silver here in the crystal structure. We docked the, enz the enzyme on a membrane patch and carried out molecular dynamic simulations for one microsecond. During that time, there was very little gross movement except the helix from the crystal structure moved to the blue location or opened up this active site more uh, to this. Then when we in turn moved uh, the helix, uh, 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 took the uh, structure and now put it in an aqueous solution and followed the molecular dynamics for another microsecond, you can see the blue helix, which was out here, moving uh, slowly over the microsecond time uh, to, to close up this active site because it's an aqueous solution and the final confirmation is what the enzyme looks like in aqueous solution with a very narrow channel here that cannot get its substrate in. When the enzyme is put on a membrane patch, this blue helix opens up, it associates with the membrane, the membrane causes the conformational change that we just observed very grossly uh, and the subsequent 
uh, binding and catalysis. We've created this picture as a scheme to that applies to all four of the enzymes I'm going to discuss. And that is that the water soluble enzyme when mixed with a phospholipid vesicle, that phospholipid causes a conformational change in the enzyme indicated by a square to a circle. This uh, very large membrane is, is uh, antithetical to the original uh, uh, proposal of an allosterism by Minot, Wyman, and Shangju which was pictured as a small allosteric site with, say, a calcium molecule, causing a conformational change in a large enzyme. In this case, it's a very large membrane that causes a conformational change in a much smaller protein relative, as is illustrated here. Now, once associated, the phospholipids move very uh, rapidly in lateral diffusion around the surface of the membrane until a single one is sucked into the catalytic site as shown here. Catalysis occurs, the products diffuse back in the membrane, and the cycle keeps repeating itself. I hope in the ensuing slides to convince you that this model uh, is a general model applicable to all of these enzymes and perhaps other membrane associated enzymes as well. Now shown here is the second, the first enzyme that I introduced, cytosolic phospholipase A2. Uh, the catalytic uh, domain of CPLA2 uh, is placed in a cube of water and on a membrane patch consist, consisting of a full bilayer membrane in purple although all we're showing here is a slice of the membrane so you can see everything clearly. Now we also docked a single phospholipid substrate in the catalytic site in accord with our deuterium exchange directed uh, docking procedures and then carried out molecular dynamic simulations. The first thing you notice is how rapidly the purple phospholipids in the membrane move with lateral diffusion, but basically staying oriented. In contrast, the phospholipid in the catalytic site is uh, much more restricted in motion, as is the whole protein, as it struggles to find the minimal energy conformation of both the phospholipid ligand and the, mem and the enzyme. And here is the arachidonic acid in a characteristic curved form formed by its four cis double bonds in its final conformation. Now, in a different experiment, we took this final docked uh, conformation and we pulled it uh, out along a straight trajectory out of the active site and back into the membrane. And then, uh, and then applied a slight force the opposite direction to allow this phospholipid to go back into its active site, and uh, which allows you to visualize how the enzyme docked to a membrane here might pull a single phospholipid out of the membrane and into the catalytic site. Uh, note that this red helix here houses the serine ash dyad that is the catalytic machinery and the serine is right adjacent to the carbonyl on the SN2 position, which is this arachidonic here, again in this curved conformation. Now, in contrast to CPLA2, enzyme that I introduced at the beginning, IPLA2, a very different enzyme, though it has the same catalytic machinery of a sear ash dyad. And here we have docked the same substrate as with CPLA2 in its catalytic site, which is a little bit more of an open site, and then carried out uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations for 300 nanoseconds. If you watch closely, you're going to see a conformational change right there, where the enzyme opened up to accommodate the SN2 fatty acid, in this case, arachidonic acid, 
in a distinct subsite that binds very specifically to the SN2 fatty acid here. The SN1 fatty acid palmitate in this case is less restricted, actually goes back a bit into the membrane. And this red helix on the enzyme uh, is buried in the membrane. So you might visualize this as having the membrane kind of coming across here where the tail of the SN1 chain is just protruding into the membrane, whereas the SN2 fatty acid, which is the leaving or cleave fatty acid, is entirely in its subsite bound tightly. Let's turn now to our lipidomics. And in lipidomics, we developed a new assay recently for phospholipids in which we can look at any natural or synthetic phospholipids in mixtures. Shown here is a mixture of five phospholipids, uh, each with the same palmitic and arachidonic group on the one and two positions, but varying in their polar group from phosphatidic acid to choline, to ethanolamine, to glycerol, to serine, both zwitterionic and anionic. And in a mixture, equimolar mixture of these five phospholipids uh, in mixed mice cells with a uh, non-ionic surfactant, the activity of the enzyme is the same toward all five substrates within experimental air. And um, this was uh, counterintuitive because previously it, often the phospholipases are identified with the polar group or the name of the phospholipid that they hydrolyze. However, here uh, it seems that the specificity is not with the polar group, but rather it is with the acyl chain that is the leaving group. As shown in the upper left, um, the best fatty acid on the SN2 position is arachidonic acid by far, as uh, was expected for CPLA2. However, when we compared the fatty acids with IPLA2, the second enzyme that I had introduced, uh, linoleic acid was by far the best substrate. And while the enzyme worked a little bit on arachidonic acid, it was much poorer than on linoleic acid. This can be explained if we look at the results of our molecular dynamics simulations um, and uh, the conformation of the phospholipids in the catalytic site. Shown on the left is CPLA2, and the polar group is surrounded by charged and polar amino acids. Uh, that is why it accommodates all the different polar groups but the specificity is in the arachidonyl group in the SN2 position shown here, where uh, it has its four double bonds uh, that are all cis, arranged such that they interact and cause great pi, uh, pi, pi stacking with the aromatic side chains that are pictured in this catalytic site. In stark contrast, in IPLA2 with the same substrate, the arachidonic acid is found bound with some specificity, but in a scrunched or uh, not ideal conformation as indicated here for the SN2 chain. The SN1 chain palmitic acid is found in its subsite here. This can become, be explained more clearly if we look at the association of a phospholipid with linoleic acid in the middle of SN2 position with these two enzymes. Shown on the right is this same substrate site for IPLA2 with linoleic acid in the phospholipid chain and the two cis uh, double bonds in linoleic acid are aligned very nicely with aromatic side chains of tyrosine and perfect pi pi stacking, uh, explaining why it binds so even better than arachidonic acid. However, when we put this same phospholipid into the active site of CPLA2 and dock it in the same manner that we docked the arachidonal containing phospholipid, the phospholipid 
uh, immediately when we started the one microsecond simulation, left the active site and went to the membrane. In other words, the difference of having two less carbons in uh, linoleic acid and two less double bonds was enough to reduce the affinity of this fatty acid chain dramatically so that it no longer could, uh, could bind with any time uh, period in the active site. Recently, uh, we wanted to look at a more biological and nutritional issue, and there was great interest in knowing uh, what would happen with the fish oil, so-called omega-3 uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, were they in the SN2 position of the membrane phospholipids in comparison with arachidonic acid, the omega-6 fatty acid. And in fact, with CPLA2, as expected, arachidonic acid was the best substrate, though EPA, uh, an omega-3 fatty acid, would work uh, uh, pretty well, but DHA very poorly. To our surprise, the IPLA2 uh, worked best on EPA compared with the other fatty acids, but most surprisingly, the the SPLA2, the secreted enzyme uh, that was the that uh, I introduced in the introduction, worked very best on DHA and very poorly on AA or EPA. Uh, and so, uh, to explain this, let's look at a little more detail at the SPLA2. On the left is shown the docked phospholipid with DHA in its uh, SN2 position in the, S in the SN2 subside here. The catalytic machinery of this enzyme is a histidine asp dyad, as well as a required calcium shown in purple, and is right here next to the SN2 carbonyl on the DHA. And there is an invariant arginine that hydrogen bonds to the phosphodiester, uh, uh, as shown here. When we carried out a one microsecond simulation, you can see that the phospholipid substrate is fixed very tightly in the catalytic site, uh, especially the SN2 chain, but the SN1 chain is actually in the membrane that is not shown here. Uh, so it's not in the catalytic site. Uh, to very much extent. Now, to show why uh, the DHA was the best substrate, we measured the distance from the catalytic nitrogen on the histidine to the carbon of the carbonyl, and it was exactly four angstroms for DHA, but much more distant on the average for AA or EPA, and these substrates moved around rapidly in the active site and had very little stability relative to the catalytic machinery, which is why DHA is the ideal substrate and these other two work extremely poorly. So to summarize in the end, uh, I believe we have shown why we, we think a water-soluble enzyme associates with the membrane where the membrane causes a conformational change in the enzyme. And by rapid lateral diffusion of the phospholipids in the surface of the membrane, a single phospholipid is sucked up into the catalytic site. And a very defined SN2 leaving group fatty acid subsite up here, which is different for each of the four enzymes exists. The polar site, which is rather similar, has little specificity and the SN1 site uh, for some of the enzymes uh, is very shallow and most of the fatty acid chain is in the membrane. So catalysis occurs, the products diffuse into the membrane and the cycle repeats itself. In quick conclusion, I, we have shown uh, and made the case that membranes allosterically activate enzymes that lipidomics can identify substrate specificity, and that a hydrophobic subsite in each enzyme determines its unique specificity. 
I wish to conclude by thanking my co-workers and collaborators who contributed so much to this study. All those shown here have participated in the deuterium exchange mass spectrometry and simulation studies that I've shown today, but particularly two recent postdocs, Barnabas Mushlis and Daiki Hayashi, uh, carried out the unpublished newest work that I showed. And I thank all of you for your attention and uh, the ASBNB for uh, making me the recipient of the Distinguished Birch Valley Award. Thank you.